Hello everyone, it's Steve with Aptera Owners Club. We've had a few videos uh, on this channel about the whole internal combustion to EV debate. And one of the things I see coming up in the comments um, in these debates is that that government should stay out of things and let the free market decide. And um, a lot of them would argue, would agree with this um, statement by Thomas Friedman, who is a very well-known columnist for the New York Times. He's a Pulitzer Prize winner. And he's one of his famous quotes is that the historical debate is over, and the answer is free market capitalism. And so a lot of people feel like uh, free market capitalism is the answer to everything without really understanding the inherent limitations of free market capitalism. And then on the flip side of the coin, because one of the things I find um, interesting um, about the world, especially these days, is that there's so much binary thinking, you know, it's like all one way or the other. So then, then you have the other side that's like kill capitalism or, you know, capitalism is evil or, you know, that capitalism is the worst thing ever. Not understanding that capitalism is probably one of the greatest uh, engines for wealth creation and innovation that the world has ever seen. Um, so I want to kind of talk about the limitations of free market capitalism um, and why that kind of informs the whole internal combustion to ICE debate. All right, so before we get started, let's talk a little bit about um, definitions because I think definitions are important when we talk about things. Investopedia has some pretty good definitions and um, articles to understand economic systems. So capitalism is an economic system characterized by private ownership in which free market alone controls the production of goods and services. And what is a free market? A free market is an economic system based on supply and demand with little or no government control. So capitalism, we're all very familiar with. What These are the main uh, tenets of capitalism. Capitalism is an economic system characterized by private ownership of the means of production, especially in the industrial sector, with labor paid only wages. Capitalism depends on the enforcement of private property rights, which provides incentives for investment in and productive use of productive capital. So that you can't have capitalism without private property. And owning private property is a big incentive because if you have if you can increase private property by working harder, there's an incentive to work harder. If you can't have, if you, if working harder doesn't give you more private property, you know, there's not much incentive to work harder, uh, which is one of the uh, major advantages of capitalism because most people are going to work harder if it benefits them. They're, most people aren't going to work harder if it benefits someone else. Um, Capitalism developed historically out of a previous system of feudalism and mercantilism in Europe and dramatically expanded industrialization and large-scale availability of mass market consumer goods. So, you know, the previous economic system in Europe before capitalism was feudalism and then mercantilism. Um, and then capitalism kind of grew out of that because feudalism have had its problems. I mean, it worked pretty well if you were an aristocrat, but it didn't work very well if you were a serf. Uh, mercantilism worked fairly well uh, for certain groups of people and didn't work well for other people. So then, you know, there people saw problems with them and we moved to capitalism. Um, and capitalism it also works very well for some people and works less well for other people. So it's not a perfect system, but it's kind of the best system we've had so far. Um, pure capitalism can be contrasted with pure socialism, where all means of productions are collective or state-owned and mixed economies, which lie on a continuum between pure capitalism and pure socialism. Real world practice of capitalism typically involves some degree of so-called crony capitalism due to demands from business for favorable government inter intervention and government incentive to intervene in economy. Okay, so we, we kind of understand what capitalism is. Most of us understand what capitalism is. It's the system generally, um, for the most part, that uh, America and most Western economies run out of. Um, but there are reasons that the free market uh, can't deal with that with everything and one of these reasons that's pretty well known is called externality and what is an externality externality is a cost or benefit caused by an economic actor that is not suffered or enjoyed by that same actor also another way of saying it is two people uh, are involved in an inner in a in an exchange like i buy something from someone else and that interaction 
our economic activity influences a third person that's not involved in that activity. So I'll give a couple examples. The examples aren't going to be perfect and you guys can punch holes in the examples, but they're just examples. This is the concept behind the example. So example is these people drive um, combustion cars. Combustion cars cause uh, smog and air pollution. And in China, it's like really, really bad. And so in China, most in, in America, most people own cars. So it's not everyone kind of feels like they're kind of equally responsible for it. Um, in places like China, uh, most people don't own cars. But there's so many people there that even the few that own cars cause a lot of pollution. And the people that don't own cars still have to deal with the pollution. They don't derive any of the advantages of driving a car, but they still have to deal with the pollution from other people owning a car. That's a negative externality. Those people that are not car owners still have to suffer the air pollution that the car owners are generating. Um, and so the car owners, they derive some benefit from it. I mean, they also have to deal with the pollution, but at least like they're getting someplace faster or they get to be in a car when it's raining. And then the car manufacturers, obviously they benefit because they're selling the cars. So, but there's a third party that's um, harmed by it. Also, if there's like a gas refinery, oil refinery, the people that live around this refinery, they don't necessarily directly benefit from um, this refinery, but they have to deal with the pollution and 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 other things from being around the uh, oil refinery. So those people that live near an oil refinery are experiencing a negative externality. Uh, another example is uh, in Brazil, farmers are clear cutting large swaths of the Amazon rainforest. Now, it makes perfect economic sense to them in a free market because now they can clear this land, make it into pasture, grow beef or grow soybeans, and they can extract economic value from this land. However, when you have thousands of people doing this and clear cutting millions of acres um, of Amazon rainforest, it is a negative for the rest of the world because the Amazon rainforest is pretty important for the global um, ecology. Uh, so if they continue to do that, which is in their best interest, it hurts kind of everyone else in the world. Uh, you lose biodiversity, you lose plants, and you lose um, CO2 absorptive capability. And, um, you, you know, there's a lot of bad effects on everyone else in the world, but those costs are not captured. Uh, another example would be like secondhand smoke. There's, uh, there's someone who smokes, and so they're deriving the enjoyment from the smoking. And the cigarette producers are deriving economic benefit from selling the cigarettes. But then people who don't smoke um, are experiencing secondhand smoke and negative health consequences from this economic activity. And um, all economic, all externalities are not negative. There are positive externalities too. Like for example, if people, more people start riding a bicycle to work, then um, there's a bunch of positive externalities. Like for example, there will be less traffic because every person that's on a bike is one less car that's on a road. And so there's less traffic. So the people that are driving now have to deal with less traffic. Also, if enough people ride a bike, there's less demand for fuel. So less demand for fuel de causes decrease in fuel prices that makes gas cheaper for the people that are driving. So it's a positive externality for them. Also, more people on bikes, less air pollution. That's a positive externality for other people. Also, people that are on bikes generally don't have the energy or mass to seriously injure other people or kill people. Whereas a car, if you hit a person with a car, you're very likely to kill them. If you hit a person on a bike, I mean, you'll injure them, but you probably won't kill them. So it's a, it's a safer vehicle. So many positive externalities, but um, those are not priced into the interaction. Um, so th this is a very good uh, article talking about how externality, prices do not capture all costs. And also prices do not capture all benefits either. So it can work both ways. And so there are several ways to deal with these externalities. Um, and so one of them is called the Pigovian tax, named after Arthur Pigal. Basically, this is saying the government imposes a tax on a negative, negative externality like pollution and tells them, 
for X amount of pollution, you're going to get a paid a, an extra tax. That kind of tax imposition makes that economic activity, such as polluting the air or polluting the water, um, less economically favorable. So that's a tax. That's sort of a market way of dealing with it. Subsidies overcome negative externalities by encouraging the consumption of positive externalities. So for example, like if you wanted to encourage people biking to work, you could subsidize those people. And that is done to a certain extent. Um, like I ride my bike and like California gives me like $25 a month because I ride my bike. It's not, it's not a very big subsidy. So I don't think it's a big enough subsidy to cause anyone's be behavior. I would ride my bike to work whether or not, whether or not I got the $25 a month for doing it. Um, and I don't think anyone who doesn't want to do it is thinking, well, if I, if I do it, I'll get the $25 a month and that'll be good. So subsidies have to be big enough to actually cause people to change behavior. Um, but that is one way of doing it. And that's what's happening with the EVs. EVs um, are thought to be a positive externality because they reduce pollution overall. And um, subsidies try to encourage things that cause positive externalities. Also, you can just do regulations like the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, that just kind of like basically instead of imposing a subsidy or a tax, you basically say you can't do it. You just regulate it. So that is a regulation. And, and you know, the whole our, our, um, idea of a laissez-faire, free market capitalism, it, it just doesn't work in the real world. You have to have some kind of regulations. If you have no regulations, people are just free to pollute wherever they want and do whatever they like. There will be monopolies um, and, and companies will use their monopolistic power to suppress competition. So you it will devolve if you don't have a party that stops monopolies and stops uh, rampant pollution and things like that. Um, lastly, there's an idea of something called Coe's theorem, which says a theory that bargaining between individuals or groups over property rights will lead to an optimal, efficient outcome. Um, people say, oh, you know, like the people can bargain with uh, the polluters and figure that out. That generally doesn't work in the real world because there's a power asymmetry. And it's very hard to get large groups of people to work together against one powerful entities like a large industry that's polluting and also like in the case of um uh like the amazon rainforest it affects the whole world you can't get them to collectively bargain with these people it's just it's very unwieldy it doesn't work very well so in these cases a pure uh free market um economy cannot handle externalities externalities must be handled by some third party usually the government, either through a tax or regulation or subsidies. And um, going back to capitalism, uh, I would briefly wanted to go over the pros and cons. And so the pros are uh, it benef the standard of living has gone up very high, uh, higher than with any other previous economic system with capitalism. And um, Milton Friedman said capitalism is a necessity condition for political freedom. It is not a sufficient condition. Uh, that is somewhat true, but you can also have capitalism in a totalitarian system. Like uh, China is basically a capitalist economy now, but the political structure is not uh, not very politically free. Um, and there are there are many uh, structures where capitalism and political freedom are not completely joined up. You can have um, a large amount of capitalism without a large amount of political freedom. Anyways, um, but generally they are linked together in general. Um, and then you causes a lot of economic growth. And so uh, capitalism has created the most economic growth in the history of the world. And so as a result, most political theorists and nearly all economists agree that capitalism is the most efficient and productive system of exchange. Now, the problems with capitalism is that it generates immense wealth disparities and social uh, inequalities, mainly because if you, if you um, capitalism requires capital accumulation and private ownership of capital. And then if you own more capital, then you can, derive more uh, value out of it, and then that will allow you to uh, accumulate even more capital. 
So it generally causes uh, extreme wealth disparity as time goes on. And, it, and this wealth disparity gets worse. And that's just a function of the way the system works. And then another drawback of capitalism is often leads to a host of negative externalities, such as air and noise pollution. That's what we talked about. Um, and because capitalism cannot um, price in these negative externalities, there is no uh, there's almost no uh, way of dealing with these negative externalities in a laissez-faire free market capitalist system. And then the last thing is crony capitalism. And of course, that is rampant once you have um, the ability to lobby and to influence government. Once someone has a lot of capital, they can use that capital to affect uh, government uh, actions uh, through bribes or lobbying. Lobbying is just basically a fancy way of saying bribes. Um, and so those are the issues. So I, I hope that was kind of uh, interesting and informative to some people when they say that we should just let the free market decide. Now, the EV is so inherently better, I think, than an ICE that uh, you know, even without taking out the externalities, the positive externalities of EVs and the negative externalities of combustion vehicles, just from a purely price and experience standpoint, in this case, I think the free market will shift to an EV anyway. But you can see that if there happened to be, let's say there was a vehicle that was invented, a theoretical vehicle that was much cheaper, like half the price of an EV, but polluted a lot. And uh, we did not have any government intervention to stop the pollution. Then that vehicle would probably take over the market because while people care about pollution, they care a little bit more about their own pocketbook. And they think, well, a little, if it's just a little bit of pollution, it doesn't really matter. But if everyone thinks that and everyone makes the same decision, a little bit of pollution becomes a lot of pollution and becomes a, a big problem. And then the, uh, just the free market system will not be able to rein that in. Okay. Well, um, I welcome your comments below. Hopefully this was um, interesting to some people. Uh, thanks for watching. And uh, thanks as always to our uh, supporting members. And have a great day, everyone.